Okay. All right. I'm doing it. Heading, <laughs> heading into November, there's one issue Donald Trump wishes would go away. It's the issue that unless he changes the conversation, it will be the issue that loses him the election and it will drag the entire Republican Party down with him. So what do you think it is? Is it the economy? Does he wish the economy, Biden's economy, would go away? Abortion, the murder rate? Or is it Donald Trump's criminal trials? It starts today. His first criminal trial starts today. What does Donald Trump want to disappear? I've been going over the polls, and some of you might be surprised by the answer which I'll get to later in the show. I'll tell you, there is one issue Trump must dispose of, and I will tell you what it is, but first I want to know what you think. So I'm conducting my own poll with the people watching me right now live on YouTube. If you're watching live on YouTube, please jump into the chat room and fill out the poll. Tell me what you think is the one issue that will drag the entire GOP down in November. Here's the poll. Is it the economy, abortion, the murder rate, or Trump's trials? I'll have the results at the end of the show of what the poll is, but I'll tell you what Donald Trump has to dispose of before November in just a few minutes. The IDF says it was able to shoot out of the sky 99% of the 300 drones and missiles Iran fired into Israeli airspace early Sunday morning. One Bedouin child in southern Israel was reportedly injured badly after shrapnel from one of the projectiles shot out of the sky and then landed on her. Iran was retaliating against Israel's attack earlier in the month on the Iranian embassy in Syria, which killed some of Iran's top military leaders. Iran's attack had nothing to do with Israel's brutal retaliation against Gaza for Hamas's October 7th attack, in which nearly 1,200 were killed, hundreds raped, and as many as 250 taken hostage. After early Sunday's attacks, Iran told the United Nations the matter is now concluded. In other words, Iran seems to be saying that is it, and Iran is now warning Israel against any retaliation for the barrage of airborne attacks early Sunday morning. What I found surprising was how effective Israel's air defenses reportedly worked. Now I'm going to tell you what I believe. I'm going to assume most of what we saw was for show, and the attacks were privately coordinated between Iran and Israel, so Iran could save face while at the same time not escalate fighting in the region region to the next level. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but in my humble opinion, Iran has Hezbollah stationed in southern Lebanon with thousands of missiles that could do some serious damage deep into Israel. And Hezbollah proved that back in 2006. From what I understand, the biggest threat facing Israel is Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And if Iran, Hezbollah takes its orders from Iran. And if Iran really wanted to attack Israel, there would be incoming missiles from southern Lebanon. If Iran wants war with Israel, southern Lebanon is the trigger point. And I suspect that unlike 2006, when Israel retaliated, when Israel engaged with Hezbollah by destroying Lebanon's major city of Beirut, This time, Israel would go all in on Tehran. With Benjamin Netanyahu as prime minister, if Hezbollah attacks Israel, I suspect Iran knows that Netanyahu would attack Tehran. I don't think Iran wants that. Iran has a lot of enemies in the region, including Saudi Arabia and possibly Jordan, which reportedly shot down some of Iran's missiles 
Sunday morning. I'm guessing the last thing Iran wants is any escalation. Right after the October 7th attack, Iran immediately said we had nothing to do with this. We did not coordinate this attack with Hamas, even though Hamas claimed Iran did. They claimed Iran helped finance it. Now, with two American aircraft carriers stationed in the Middle East since October 7th and President Biden telling Iran, don't, I'm going to assume Sunday morning's attack was an opportunity for Iran to save face after Israel's attack in Syria on the Iranian embassy. And it was an opportunity for the United States and Israel to show off Israel's multi-layered air defense system, which we are being told worked exceptionally well. I'm a bit dubious. I'm probably wrong. But I have always been suspicious of America's air defense capabilities. Back during the first Gulf War, America deployed Patriot missiles in Israel to shoot incoming Scud missiles out of the sky, Scud missiles that had been fired by Iraq. Back then, we were told to believe that the Patriot missiles were a tremendous success. But reporting by Bill Sapphire from the New York Times revealed that the Patriot missiles were not as accurate, not as successful as we were led to believe by our Pentagon. It turns out during the first Gulf War, those Patriots missed a lot of the Scud missiles. And the Scud missiles they did hit ended up blowing up over Israel and doing a lot of damage as the shrapnel rained down on Israeli villages. There is a lot of money in convincing Americans that missiles can be shot out of the sky. When North Korea began testing ballistic missiles, President Obama began stationing anti-ballistic missiles, defense systems, in the Pacific. And I remember asking, do they work? Have they worked? And I never got a straight answer. All the reporting I've seen says America cannot shoot ballistic missiles out of the sky. But the reports coming out of Israel insist America and Israel now have that capability. It makes me suspicious. We are now being told that Israel has the Arrow Defense System, which works in outer space and is able to shoot long-range missiles out of the sky. Missiles fired by Iran and earlier in the year, missiles fired by Houthi rebels that America was able to shoot out of the sky. This is the Star Wars defense that Reagan was promoting back in the 80s. If these reports are true, this is a major development. Major. We are now hearing of something called David's Sling, which was developed in Israel with America to shoot medium-range missiles out of the sky. Then there's the Patriot missiles, which have been around for at least three decades. Israel is relying on Patriot missiles. As I said earlier, Bill Sapphire at the Times decades ago wrote that we were misled during the first Gulf War about the efficacy of the Patriot missiles. I'm going to assume they've gotten better, especially with AI. The Associated Press reports this morning that the Patriots were used over the weekend to shoot down Iranian drones. And then there's Israel's famed Iron Dome, developed by Raytheon, which is used to shoot down short-range missiles fired out of Gaza. The Associated Press reports that Israel claims Iron Dome, since October 7th, has had a 90% success rate. So... What am I saying here? I'm not suggesting Israel didn't shoot 300 missiles out of the sky Sunday morning. And I hope they did. But I do believe the entire attack was coordinated with Iran. I believe Sunday morning was for show. I do. One day, I believe we will discover Iran was sharing with Israel's 
the coordinates to every launch of their drones and their missiles because Iran knew if any of those missiles landed and did any damage, it would be World War III. Again, I hope Israel can shoot missiles out of the sky. I hope America can shoot missiles out of the sky. I also hope Iran and Israel were coordinating targets so they could be shot out of the sky. I like to believe that Biden and the State Department are working behind the scenes maintaining the peace. But I do know since Ronald Reagan began funding the Star Wars defense system, all the reporting shows it to be a massive failure. When did this change? All the reporting shows that whenever our Pentagon tested shooting missiles out of the sky, it only worked when we fudged the results and gave the air defense systems a heads up on the coordinates. Perhaps all the reporting on air defense missiles, the advancement in in air defense missiles, has moved into the realm of classified. Maybe that's why we're not hearing about it. Perhaps it's all top secret. And that's why I can't find out when exactly America developed the capability to shoot ballistic missiles out of the sky. Perhaps the only one who knows the answer to such a top secret classified question would be the groundskeeper at Mar-a-Lago. I think in one of the boxes at a, inside a bathroom at Mar-a-Lago, we could find out when exactly America learned how to shoot missiles out of the sky. If we're being told the truth. I find it odd that suddenly America has the capability to shoot all these missiles out of the sky and we were never told about it. Now, I've seen just personally some of the advances in AI. Uh, It wouldn't surprise me. I just don't know how much of what we're hearing about Sunday morning in Israel is true. I do know there are trillions of dollars at stake making American taxpayers believe it's true. I know it's in the best interest of Raytheon to convince Americans that Iron Dome works and we can shoot missiles out of the sky. I also know we, ought, we can't audit the Pentagon. And I do know CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News were lousy Saturday night early Sunday morning with retired generals who secretly work as lobbyists for military contractors, retired generals on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, quietly, secretly working as lobbyists for military contractors, telling Americans how great Israel's American-made air defense systems are working. It would be nice for congressional hearings to learn just how accurate these anti-ballistic missiles are. It would also be nice if CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News told us who exactly these retired generals are working for. I know we've deployed air defense missiles in Ukraine. I hope they're working, but Ukraine is losing. Joe Biden wants to give Ukraine another $60 billion, and I think that's a good idea. But maybe these Republicans in the House who are calling for an audit of the Pentagon and Republicans in the House can't wait to hold hearings on how Biden blew the pullout from Afghanistan. He did not. It's one of the greatest things any president ever accomplished. But I know Republicans in the House like to challenge the Pentagon Maybe they would like to hold hearings on America's air defense capabilities. I'd like to know how effective these air defenses are, because France, with their Maginot line, thought they were safe during World War II until they were not. Sad, sad news. O.J. Simpson who thrilled football fans, setting rushing records for the Buffalo Bills, then going on to become one of America's most trusted sports commentators, 
topping off his career with comedic turns in the Naked Gun series, as well as being one of America's top brand ambassadors for companies like Hertz. Well, late last week, O.J. Simpson took way too long to die at the age of 76. You know, O.J. Simpson may have been richer than I am, more talented than I am, better looking than I ever was. But as I told all of my wives and all of my children, David Feldman was a much better husband than O.J. Simpson. O.J.'s broadcasting and acting career took a back seat when he became a widower at the age of 46 and was forced to raise his children as a single dad while spending the rest of his life looking for the assassins who murdered his wife and her friend, Ron Goldman. And now, with O.J.'s passing, I guess we'll never get to the bottom of one of the great mysteries of the 20th century, who killed O.J. Simpson's wife. Now, to O.J.'s credit, O.J. never stopped looking. Early on, he believed it was Colombian drug dealers. So O.J. moved to Florida to insinuate himself into that seedy world. Yet, he came up empty. The Los Angeles police gave up the hunt completely. But O.J. Simpson, for 30 years, sacrificed his acting and broadcasting career. He turned down major commercial endorsements because he didn't want to lose focus on his relentless pursuit for answers in what everyone else told him was a cold case. Who killed O.J.'s wife and her friend, Ron Goldman? I guess now we'll never know. Unless you want to believe all the evidence, and not just the evidence planted by the Los Angeles Police Department. If you want to believe all the evidence, it was O.J. Simpson. But that really was never the point, was it? On the heels of the L.A. riots after the police officers who beat the crap out of Rodney King got acquitted by a mostly all-white jury, the O.J. Simpson saga was one of America's first major reckonings with our two-tiered justice system. Nobody encapsulated it better than O.J. Simpson. We saw that there was the justice system for white people and the justice system for black people. There is the justice system for rich people, and there is the justice system for poor people. O.J. Simpson threw a wrench into all of that by being a rich black man. Detective Mark Furman, hours after the murder, well, he only saw O.J. as a black man, so he planted evidence. Mark Furman had a long history of using the N-word. He would brag to police psychiatrists about torturing black suspects. When he was a police officer, he told police psychiatrists that he couldn't work as a patrol officer anymore. He was afraid he'd kill black and Mexican suspects. So the LAPD did what any reasonable law enforcement agency would do. They made him a detective. Mark Furman had a history of using the N-word, told his superiors he was afraid he was going to kill black and Mexican suspects, and the LAPD said, well, I guess we'll just have to make you a detective. Too racist to be a patrol officer, so in the LAPD's infinite wisdom, they made Mark Furman a detective. But eventually, Mark Furman revealed himself to be even too racist for the LAPD, which is why after the O.J. Simpson trial, he became a mainstay on Fox News. But before that, right after he got promoted to detective, Mark Furman knew O.J. had been beating Nicole Simpson. He had been beating her for nearly a decade before finally killing her. Furman was one of the detectives who responded to one of Nicole Simpson's many 911 calls, 
telling police O.J. was threatening to kill her. It was Furman, as a detective, who arrived on the scene and witnessed O.J. trying to smash Nicole Simpson's Mercedes with a baseball bat while she cowered inside. Furman talked to O.J., and O.J. dropped the baseball bat and apologized. But Mark Furman never forgot that scene. So, when Nicole Simpson Simpson ended up dead a few years later, Furman knew who was responsible. Did Mark Furman plant the bloody glove in O.J.'s backyard to speed the conviction along? In my humble opinion, absolutely. Because Mark Furman was first and foremost a racist, and he figured this is what you do with black suspects who you know are, are guilty. Plant a little evidence to spare the state of California a murder trial. Mark Furman figured O.J. was black, and he'll cop a guilty plea because that's how it's done in Los Angeles. That's how it's done in America. And O.J. was about to cop a guilty plea. Furman was right. When O.J. flew back from Chicago, he knew they had him dead to rights. You might remember, if you're old enough, during the police chase in the white Bronco, O.J. had a gun to his head and was ready to pull the trigger. It was going to be a murder-suicide. We all thought O.J. was going to kill himself because he felt horrible that he had just killed his wife, the mother of his children, and the transcripts of the phone conversation he had with homicide detective Tom Lang during the police chase, revealed that this was about to become a murder-suicide. Homicide detective Tom Lang stayed on the phone with O.J. throughout the car chase, and he calmly talked O.J. out of committing suicide. He said, O.J., you got a lot of people who love you and are rooting for you, and O.J. looked up, and the overpass in L.A. was filled with passion, uh, uh, fans holding up signs. We love you, Juice. So O.J. didn't pull the trigger. Instead, he pulled into his estate in Brentwood. I believe it was Brentwood, right? He got out of the Bronco, took a look around, and he remembered, wait a second, I'm a multi-millionaire. And his friends descended on him. Robert Kardashian, Kim's dad, assembled a dream team of lawyers who put the Los Angeles Police Department on trial. It was really the LAPD that was put on trial, not O.J. Simpson. And by the time O.J. was acquitted, most of us knew he killed his wife and Ron Goldman But the L.A. Police Department, most certainly Mark Furman, probably planted the evidence. And in America, you cannot do that to a rich person, even if they're black. Had O.J. Simpson just been a black guy, he'd be getting out of prison right around now, maybe. The number of inmates sitting in jail has tripled since O.J. Simpson was arrested. Two-thirds of Americans sitting in jail this morning have yet to be convicted of a crime. Close to half a million Americans are sitting in a jail cell this morning, never convicted, all part of pretrial detention because they can't post bail. Now, jail is in prison. Prison is where you go after getting convicted. 1.2 million Americans are in a prison this morning. Sometimes when you're convicted, you also go to jail. But 1.2 million Americans are in a prison this morning. What percentage of them ever had a jury trial? Hard to say when it comes to state prisons. I 
can never get a straight answer, no, ha- no matter how many times I've asked this question. The Sixth Amendment guarantees every American citizen the right to a fair and speedy trial. How many people behind bars today got one? When it comes to federal prisons, the Pew Research Center reports that nine out of 10 defendants in federal cases plead guilty before it ever goes to trial. Pew says that in 2022, the federal government drew up charges against 71,954 Americans, only 1,669 out of 71,954 of those charged ever had a jury trial. Why? Because just like our immigration process, our asylum process, here in America, we do criminal justice on the cheap. We punish Americans for exercising their Sixth Amendment right to a fair and speedy trial. The prosecutors literally tell suspects, do not make me mount a trial against you. Do not make me spend the money to provide you with your Sixth Amendment right to a trial. Don't make me angry. Plead guilty now and you'll get a lesser sentence. Plea out. If you make me mount a trial and you're found guilty and look at your public defender, do you think he's going to get you off? If you make me mount a trial and you're found guilty, we'll make sure the judge gives you the maximum sentence. And the judges are complicit in all this. The judges are complicit in denying all of us our Sixth Amendment rights. The judges are in on the plea deals to save money for the state. Plead guilty, and I'll give you a much shorter sentence. I know you think you're innocent. You may be, but look at your public defender. So that's what we know about the federal prisons. Okay, nine out of ten people in federal prisons pled out. They never got a trial. You can only imagine how much worse this is when it comes to state offenses and state prisons, especially in the poorer red states, which are more likely to punish a defendant with longer sentences when they force the state to spend money they don't have on money for a trial. In the 30 years since O.J. murdered Nicole and the Goldman kid, Ron Goldman, I think it's safe to assume that most white people finally understand why so many black people cheered after O.J. was acquitted. 30 years after O.J. murdered his wife and Ron Goldman, most Americans now have a keener understanding of why so many white people cheer for Donald Trump every time he's able to delay justice. We're now able to understand why so many are rooting for Donald Trump. They're rooting for him not because they think he's innocent. They're rooting for him because they know he's guilty and they want to live vicariously through Donald Trump, the same way Americans during the Great Depression lived vicariously through Dillinger, Bonnie, and Clyde, or the gangster Donald Trump loves to talk about out on the campaign trail, Alphonse Capone. You ever hear Donald Trump talk longingly about Alphonse Capone? Trump doesn't call him Al. He calls him Alphonse, Alphonse Capone, as a sign of respect. Americans, some Americans, are rooting for Donald Trump because they know he's guilty. They want him to walk. They want him to become president. 
because they think the entire system here in America is rigged. And they're right. The system is rigged. Donald Trump may be a pathological liar, but he's not lying when he says the system is rigged. What he conveniently leaves out is that the system is rigged in his favor. Two things can be true at the same time. Mark Furman probably planted the bloody glove, but OJ was guilty. Two things can be true. Donald Trump is guilty of everything he's been charged with, and then some. But everything his lawyers and his defenders say about America's justice system and our FBI is also true. You know, what makes me despise Donald Trump the most is he's turned me into a defender of the FBI. You think I like singing the praises of the FBI? James Comey? James Comey? He's one of the reasons Hillary lost. Reopening the investigation into her emails 11 days before the presidential election, pulled a Robert Herr in July of 2016 when he announced that I'm not going to prosecute Hillary, but then he offered up an unsolicited opinion, just like Robert Herr, the special counsel in the investigation of Joe Biden's mishandling of classified documents. James Comey, in the summer of 2016, said, I'm not going to prosecute Hillary Clinton, but she's been extremely careless, extremely careless, he said, with her handling of these emails. Well, you use the term extremely careless, either prosecute or shut your mouth. Extremely careless means, to some, you should be prosecuting. It was James Comey's responsibility to say, we're not prosecuting, period. But James Comey thought he was better than everybody, and he insinuated himself into the political process. He and America paid a price for that. Donald Trump got elected. Uh, had Hillary won, it's worth mentioning, I do this every month, and I will up until November. Had Hillary won in 2016, she'd now be serving out her second term. And that means six out of nine Supreme Court justices would have been appointed by her and Barack Obama. Think about that for a second. Biden picked one. Hillary would have picked that one. And then she would have picked the three that Trump picked. That's four plus the two that uh, Obama picked. Six out of nine justices would have been picked by Hillary and Obama. I remember Hillary supporters in 2016 saying this. I know you don't like Hillary. Think about the courts. They kept saying, this is about Roe. And they were right. Hillary kept saying, her surrogates kept saying, maybe you don't like Hillary and Bill. Think of the courts. This is about Roe. And it was. The Black Lives Matter movement isn't just about the injustices perpetrated against black people. The same way the Me Too movement isn't just about the injustices perpetrated against women. White people also have much to gain from the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's the same way men also have much to gain from the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement, by the way, uh, started so much, like so much in America, it, uh, the Me Too movement, we owe the black community uh, 
for the Me Too movement. It, it be, the Me Too movement began in the black community for black women to deal with their issues with abusive men. It later, by 2017, right, became a movement for all women. But both movements, Black Lives Matter and Me Too, shine light not just on the privilege white people or men enjoy in America. They also shine light on the injustices white people feel every time they have to deal with our criminal justice system when they lack the financial resources. The Me Too movement also shines light on the power and balance that men find in the workplace. Not nearly as bad as women, but men are verbally and physically abused in the workplace and held down because powerful men don't just enjoy their power, they also enjoy holding people down. What good is power? A lot of these men believe, unless it can be exercised on someone's throat. So, Dr. King said it best, no one is free until we are all free. America has more prisoners than any country in the world. More prisoners per capita and more prisoners just in terms of sheer numbers. OJ did die a free man for one reason. He had the money. He got away with killing his wife and Ron Goldman for the same reason Harvey Weinstein almost got away with it for so long. OJ got away with it for the same reason the head of Fox News, Roger Ailes, never got prosecuted for rape. Les Moonves, the CEO of CBS, never got prosecuted for rape. Because OJ, like Roger Ailes, like Les Moonves, they all had money. But OJ, like the rest of us here in America, was never free. Because as long as one woman is held down against her will, as long as one black man is unfairly prosecuted, nobody is free. This is the mop-up for April 15th, 2024. Pay your taxes. And you know, if Bill Gates paid his taxes, he wouldn't need the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Why don't you pay your effing taxes, Bill Gates, and let Congress, let us decide democratically where your ill-gotten gains should be spent. You're not a philanthropist, Bill Gates. You're a tax cheat. Pay your taxes. Uh, if you're enjoying any of this, please like this episode so I remain in your feed and uh, share this with like-minded people. And leave a comment. We are a MAGA-free zone. If you're a Republican or a Trump supporter, you're not welcome here. They've tried to leave comments. Uh, first, they came with the bots. We were able to use AI to keep them out. And now we're getting some just basic subhuman, I won't call them human, uh, subhuman MAGA trolls who try to leave comments not interested in what you have to say. Not interested in what Neanderthals, what subhumans think about what's going on in the world. It's not subject to debate. You're voting for Trump. You're an imbecile. I don't want you in my life. So, But if you're not voting for Trump, uh, feel free to leave a comment on this channel or my website. I'm always interested in what you have to say. Not interested in what imbeciles have to say. They're, you're bad. We're, you're not, you, you people are not served. And I'm using the term people generously. Your kind is not welcome here. Seriously. Climate change, not to be discussed. Unions, not to be discussed. Transgender issues, not to be discussed. Joe Biden, not to be discussed. Go F yourself. You're not welcome. 
don't leave a comment on my channel. It won't be posted. Besides his wife, O.J. also killed her friend Ron Goldman, and that's what a jury ruled after Ron Goldman's dad, Fred Goldman, sued O.J. in a civil courtroom for damages. Ron Goldman's father told the Daily Mail this week he wasn't sad about O.J.'s passing. Goldman said that Simpson died owing him $100 million. Most of that is accrued interest from the $33 million judgment Simpson refused to pay and got away with not paying by moving to Florida and taking advantage of Florida's homestead and bankruptcy protection laws. OJ created countless LLCs in Florida, which made it impossible to track his money. This explains why Donald Trump is no longer a resident of Trump Tower in Manhattan and lists Mar-a-Lago as his primary residence. President Biden hinted last week that he may drop charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, who our Justice Department has been trying to extradite here to the United States to face charges of violating the Espionage Act. You know, the the same thing Donald Trump is charged with, violating the Espionage Act. Assange has been sitting in a London jail, has lost appeal after appeal in Great Britain, and for the past year it has looked like he was about to be shipped off to the United States. But now Biden may have cold feet. He may allow Assange to return to his home country, Australia. Why? America's Attorney General Merrick Garland is probably realizing that this may not be the trial our country wants to have. You see, Assange is entitled to defend himself. This isn't Gitmo. There are First Amendment issues at stake here, and the world will be watching. You know, one of the judges in Great Britain said she didn't want to send Julian Assange to America because she was afraid he would commit suicide in one of our prisons. Our prison... Our prisons are famous for their abuse. So the world will be watching if Merrick Garland is stupid enough to put Julian Assange on trial for violating the Espionage Act. Did anything Julian Assange leak endanger any of our intelligence assets overseas? Most reporting says no. So, why was any of what Assange leaked deemed classified? To protect higher-ups in the Pentagon and the CIA from getting prosecuted. Most of what gets classified are documents that are embarrassing to government officials. Documents that, if they fell into the wrong prosecutor's hands could get somebody arrested, somebody who works inside our government. That's why so many classified documents ended up in Joe Biden's and Mike Pence's garages. When they were packing up, their assistants looked at the papers and they thought, well, this is, I'll just take this. There's no way this is top secret. You know how they have great inflation at Yale? If you go to Yale or Harvard, you're guaranteed an A minus. We have classified inflation. Everything gets deemed top secret and classified. We over classify documents in Washington, D.C. Mostly everything should not be classified, uh, it's bad for our democracy. Assange leaked a trove of documents uncovering war crimes American soldiers committed in Iraq and Afghanistan, crimes in which American soldiers fired from an Apache helicopter indiscriminately at innocents, laughing 
while they gunned these innocents down. You've seen the videos. Why were those videos marked classified? To protect the soldiers, to protect the higher-ups from being prosecuted for war crimes. And yet, the only person prosecuted for these war crimes was Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning for leaking this information. So is this really the trial Merrick Garland wants to have? If Julian Assange were to go on trial here in America, I have no doubt, like Trump's lawyers down in Miami with the classified documents trial, the Espionage Act case, I have no doubt that Julian Assange's lawyers would try to enter what he leaked into evidence which would force the Justice Department and our Pentagon and our CIA, it would force them, at least in the court of international public opinion, to explain why nobody in our military ever got prosecuted for these crimes against humanity that Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange uncovered, and they are war crimes. I would offer that Assange and uh, Chelsea Manning would be protected by the whistleblower acts. But how could anybody who committed crimes against humanity uh, that Julian Assange leaked, how could they be prosecuted when the entire invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan were crimes against humanity. We know Iraq didn't attack us on 9-11, but we invaded Iraq anyway and killed millions. We knew they didn't have WMDs, but we invaded anyway and killed millions. What most Americans still are not allowed to know is that Afghanistan, just like Iraq, didn't attack us on 9-11. Afghanistan did not attack us on 9-11. Most Americans think Afghanistan did. Most Americans still don't know that the Taliban had nothing to do with 9-11. Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda were just another lawless tribe hiding out in the hills of Tora Bora. They were getting their financing from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, which is why bin Laden died in Pakistan. The Taliban had nothing to do with 9-11, but we attacked them anyway. For 20 years, more than 20 years, Afghanistan was America's longest war. And they never attacked us. Yeah, I don't think the Biden administration wants to put Julian Assange on trial. I think it's in everybody's best interest for everybody to forget what he exposed about our war. Our illegal global war on terror, which continues... To this day, I don't think Julian Assange will be coming here to America. Donald Trump becomes the first American president ever to go on trial inside a criminal courtroom today. And next week, our Supreme Court will hear oral arguments on presidential immunity, whether a president has the divine rights of kings and can do whatever he wants to whomever he wants without facing any repercussions from our Justice Department after they leave office. Now, we know presidents, when they leave office, have the divine rights of kings. We know this. We know that. We know George W. Bush should be tried not 
in The Hague, but right here in the United States for his criminal prosecution of both the wars in in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was the most criminal act any president has ever committed. But that's never going to happen. Donald Trump, however, made the mistake of invading Congress, and that you're not allowed to do. Okay? You can invade the wrong country and kill millions of people. You have the divine rights of kings. But if a president invades Congress, well, we can't have that, nor should we. I'd like to see him prosecuted. Two things can be true. George W. Bush should be prosecuted as a war criminal, and Donald Trump should be prosecuted uh, for leading an insurrection. Given all the crimes against humanity that previous presidents, especially George W. Bush, have gotten away with it, gotten away with, it should come as no surprise that a good number of Americans know Trump is guilty. The same way a good number of black people knew OJ was guilty, but they want Trump to get away with it because they're sick of the pretense that there is anything resembling justice here in the United States. I don't buy into that. I know we have a two tiered justice system. But I'm not giving up. Just because, like I just said, just because George W. Bush never got prosecuted doesn't mean we don't prosecute Donald Trump. One of the justices, by the way, I apologize. People complain uh, when I drink water. I've been told I have a loud gulp. I'm a very quiet eater. I chew with my mouth closed. I don't talk with food in my mouth. But I have a loud gulp. And it annoys some of the listeners. One of the justices hearing those oral arguments next week on presidential immunity will be Clarence Thomas, who seems 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 to enjoy his own special brand of immunity. We all know he sexually harassed Anita Hill. We all know there were other women willing to come forward to testify against him. But Senator Joe Biden, then chairman of the Judiciary Committee, didn't want to open up that Pandora's box the same way he doesn't want to prosecute Julian Assange. Many are calling on Clarence Thomas to recuse himself from the immunity hearings next week, especially since his unhinged and detestable wife, Ginny, attended the January 6th rally. She helped organize it. And after Biden won, immediately after Biden won, she was in constant contact with Trump's White House chief of staff, Mark Meadows. She was urging him to keep fighting Biden's election She said to stand up for Sidney Powell, and she called this a battle between good and evil. After, uh, right in the lead up to January 6th, she said, tell Trump to keep fighting. This is a battle between good and evil. You think maybe Clarence Thomas should recuse himself from next week's hearings? Back on November 30th, the democratically controlled Senate Judiciary Committee, despite objections from Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham, subpoenaed conservative judicial activist Leonard Leo as part of their ongoing investigation into lavish gifts bestowed upon Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito by Leonard Leo, and even more troubling, Texas billionaire Harlan Crow. It was all of this was discovered by ProPublica, which you should donate to. Well, on Thursday, Leonard Leo refused the subpoena, saying he would not participate in these hearings. 
His lawyers called these hearings unlawful and politically motivated. As one of the directors of the conservative Federalist Society, Leonard Leo was described by Jeffrey Tubin as being responsible for nearly one-third of the entire Supreme Court. It is the Federalist Society that vets Supreme Court justices for the Republicans. We'll see if uh, he's uh, charged with contempt of Congress. Peter Navarro is sitting in a jail cell this morning for ignoring a subpoena. And Steve Bannon should be sitting in a jail cell, but Steve Bannon has more money than Peter Navarro, so his lawyers have been able to delay, delay, delay. The Environmental Protection Agency said U.S. emissions of greenhouse gases have fallen 17% since 2005, but increased by 1% between 2021 and 2022. I suspect that might have something to do with the steep drop in emissions in 2020 due to COVID. Remember that? Remember when like, you could hear the birds singing, everybody was quarantined, uh, but as the, economy began to, as the economy began to pick up, uh, in 2021 and 2022, the emissions uh, did as well. There's something to be said for shutting down the economy until we get off fossil fuels. The EPA is warning us about PFAs. America's tap water has too many forever chemicals. And the EPA is warning water utilities around America to begin removing them But the EPA is getting pushback from some utilities who say removing the chemicals, also referred to as PFAs, would be too costly. We'll see. I thought that's what the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act was supposed to do, get the PFAs out of our tap water. Certainly, our government wouldn't allow forever chemicals in our tap water. I mean, remember what happened in Flint, Michigan? They cleaned that right up. Joe Biden's State of the Union was on March 7th, and he saw record-setting campaign contributions the very next day. And now five weeks out, we're beginning to see a shift in the polls. Before the State of the Union, the race between Trump and Biden was tight, but Trump was leading Biden in all the national polls by numbers that were slightly larger than the margin of error. This was before the State of the Union. Now we're seeing a tightening as Biden erases that deficit in all the polls, and he's running ahead of Trump in some new ones. The New York Times has a new poll out. This is one of the most respected polls. It's showing a dead heat with 46% of Americans saying they're voting for Trump, 45% saying they're voting for Biden. That's a tie, and it's a significant improvement compared to February when Trump was leading Biden by five points uh, beyond the margin of error. So, at the top of the show, I asked, what is the issue Trump wants to disappear? What would Trump... What does Trump know he needs to make disappear in order uh, to not get defeated in November? On this show, it has been received wisdom that the Democrats want this election to be about abortion. And we know that. They're putting abortion on the ballot in a lot of these swing states. Trump wisely is trying to pull the party away from abortion and making the campaign about rising crime, the state of the economy, and of course, the migrants. The problem for Trump, all those issues are lies. But will they work in weakening Biden? Homicides, according to new reporting in this morning's Wall Street Journal, down under the Biden administration. Homicides in 133 major cities Blue cities have dropped 
20% in the first quarter of 2024 compared to the same period a year ago. The Wall Street Journal says this is the sharpest decline in homicides in decades. Why? Well, as my listeners have pointed out in the comments section, when the economy is strong, people are less likely to commit violent crimes or any crimes at all. And Joe Biden's economy, despite Donald Trump's lies, is a juggernaut. So, can Trump run on crime or the economy? What about the economy? From the same Wall Street Journal, a survey of economists conducted by the Wall Street Journal, this new survey of economists, they are calling Biden's American economy, quote, the envy of the world. The journal said, this is the Wall Street Journal. The journal says most economists believe within the next year, inflation will continue to to get tamed, and we're not even close to a recession. This recession, everybody was predicting for the past three years, they've stopped predicting it. You know, I like to quote the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, The Financial Times, Bloomberg, uh, and I especially like to cite the Wall Street Journal because it's not just owned by Rupert Murdoch, but it's a right-wing rag, at least its editorial page is. So when this is coming from the Wall Street Journal, it means something. With earlier reports of consumer confidence hitting its highest point in more than two years, the Wall Street Journal is now reporting that economists are also the most confident about the economy in more than two years. So consumers are confident, economists are confident. Other polling that I've seen shows that most Americans, when asked, will say the country's economy is in shambles. But as for their own personal finances, well, most Americans say, personally, they are doing much better than they were when Donald Trump was president, even with inflation. So, Can Trump run on the economy? Well, he would have to lie the same way he has to lie about crime in America. But can he win telling lies about the economy and crime? Uh, Despite the fact that there is no migrant crisis, we're just doing it on the cheap. The crisis is we can't process all the asylum seekers, because we aren't willing to spend the money. Uh, Despite the fact that the migrant crisis is imaginary, isn't affecting Americans unless they watch Fox News or listen to Republicans, all polling shows this imaginary migrant crisis that has been hammered on incessantly by Trump, Fox and the Republicans, it is a weakness for Biden. Most polling shows that when Americans are asked what they think Biden is weak on, immigration. So, of all the issues where Biden is perceived to have dropped the ball, Americans think, more than anything else, it's immigration. And Trump gets that. That's why he blocked the bipartisan border bill. He specifically told Mike Johnson, kill the bipartisan border bill. I need this phony migrant crisis to run on in November. Most Americans, when polled, think Donald Trump can do a better job on immigration than Joe Biden can. So that's good for Trump. But... Just because Americans think Trump is better on the border than Biden is, is that what the election will hinge upon? Because it's important to know what Americans are worried about. 
Can Trump keep lying about the border? Can he keep scaring Americans into believing we're being invaded by frightened women and children? See, just because Americans think Biden is weak on immigration, it doesn't mean Americans think this is what the election should be about. Now, this election will be decided by suburban women in swing states. So the question is, what do they care about? What are suburban women in swing states terrified of? What is their biggest concern? And the Wall Street Journal has some new polling on suburban women in swing states Not good for Donald Trump. Biden won the swing states. He won uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Hillary didn't. He won mostly because of suburban women. Right now, polls are showing Biden leading Trump by 10 points when it comes to women overall. In swing states, in the sum, in the suburbs, it's tighter. Uh, Biden is leading Trump uh, by six points among suburban women in swing states. When it comes down to suburban white women in swing states, it's a dead heat. Now, it's a given urban areas even in the deepest red states, are going to vote for Joe Biden. We all know traditionally Democrats have trouble in any and all rural districts. The suburbs are where this election will be decided, where where urban meets rural, right... The suburbs is the sweet spot, and that's where this election is going to be decided, and it's going to be determined by suburban women in swing states. And suburban women are the key to a Biden victory. But has Donald Trump succeeded in convincing suburban women the caravans of migrants are invading the country. Has Trump succeeded in convincing suburban women that women that's too dangerous to go outside, they're going to get murdered? Has he convinced them the economy has tanked? What concerns suburban women? Well, the Wall Street Journal has new polling showing that suburban women in swing states are not concerned about migrants. They're not concerned about crime. They're not concerned about inflation. There is one issue for suburban women that eclipses all others, and it's exactly what Joe Biden wants it to be. It's what I've been telling you it was going to be, abortion. This election is about abortion. I said it would be about abortion a year ago, but I never thought it would be this much about abortion. But this election is is the abortion election. And this, this is the issue. Donald Trump is smart enough to know he cannot win with. He cannot win on abortion, and he cannot get rid of this issue. It is abortion, abortion, abortion. I didn't realize how much this issue was. I I said it would be about abortion, but I didn't know it would be this sticky. This is uh, what the Democrats want. Now, Last week, uh, Trump literally called a 15-week national abortion ban political malpractice. 
since Iowa. I talked about this in the lead up to the Iowa caucuses. Trump knew that he would lose in November if this election was about abortion. As early as Iowa, he was distancing himself from the evangelicals and telling them, we're going to lose in November unless you drop abortion. But they can't. The evangelicals, they cannot drop abortion because they do believe that it's murder. The seeds were planted during his administration when he appointed those three hard right pro-life justices to the court, and they tipped the scales, making it possible to overturn Roe. And those reverberations are impossible to stop. It's Newtonian. Things in motion stay in motion. There is not a force in the Republican Party equal, powerful enough to stop what's already in motion. We all knew Trump couldn't care less about abortion, but the people he pandered to, especially in states like Alabama, Texas, Florida, Arizona... They care about abortion. To them, it's not a joke. These pro-lifers who put Trump over the top, they really think life begins at conception. They're not saying this for political expediency. They believe abortion is murder to the core of their very being. And you can't suddenly say to them, hey, you know that thing we told you we wanted to outlaw well, we still want to outlaw it, but not really because we're going to lose elections if we follow through with making it illegal. But we still want to fundraise off it. We just never thought we would actually succeed in making it illegal. The Republicans created a Frankenstein uh, They created an electorate as well as politicians who really believe the issue of our time is outlawing abortion from the moment of conception. These voters, these politicians in deep red states uh, are enacting anti-abortion laws that often offer no exemptions for rape and incest. And you cannot stop them. This is a serious problem, not just for the women who live in these states. Uh, it's a problem uh, for, for Donald Trump and the Republican Party. It is turning off suburban women. Polling by the Wall Street Journal this morning shows The migrant crisis doesn't resonate with suburban women in swing states. Abortion does. Asked, what is the single most important issue? Abortion. More than double immigration. 39% of suburban women in swing states told the Wall Street Journal that the single most important issue is abortion. 39%, only 16% say it's immigration. Now, what does that mean? Uh, 16% are worried about immigration. And only 7% of suburban women say the single biggest issue is our economy. Crime isn't even registering. Only 4% say the biggest issue is inflation. So let's dig a little deeper into this. Trump has a fact that he can run on. Everything else is a lie. Uh, The economy, he has to lie about the economy, he has to lie about crime, he has to lie about migrants... Uh, he has to lie about abortion because he was never, he used to, until he became a Republican, he was pro-choice. 
there's one truth that he can tell, and that is inflation. Uh, inflation is a is a problem, uh, a minor problem. It popped in March with the rise in prices for gas and rent. Uh, not, it didn't slow the way the Fed or Biden wants. Uh, we're, the same week that we saw incredible job numbers that defied everyone's expectations, we also saw inflation popping a little. And that is to be expected with incredible job numbers. But the inflation is there. Groceries are higher than they were when Donald Trump was president. It is the one thing Trump could run on, the one thing he doesn't really have to lie about. But I'm going to tell you in a moment how Biden is fighting inflation, and he deserves a lot more credit than he's getting for fighting inflation. I'm I'm going to talk about this, and and we need to chant if you're if you're stumping for Biden, you got to get this message out because he's a little vulnerable on inflation. Not really, but I'm going to tell you in a second what he's doing, and uh, it's fantastic. Here it is in last week's again the Wall Street Journal why. Inflation, theoretically, should be Biden's most stubborn political problem. Uh, Again, the polling shows inflation doesn't register as a problem for Biden among suburban women. What was it, 4%? But as I have been saying, and the Wall Street Journal concurs, this is about a week ago, inflation would or at least should, be the one foundational truth that Donald Trump could run against Biden on. But Trump doesn't run on foundational truths. He runs on bigotry, fear, racism. And all three of those are wrapped up in the migrant crisis and crime. He's thinking he's going to win on hate, And inflation, you end up hating the wrong people if you're a Republican. You can't hate greedy corporations if you're running as a Republican. So he can't really run on inflation, Trump, because we all know who's to blame for inflation, the greedy corporations. So he's got to stick with racism and bigotry and fear and that's crime and migrants. The consumer price index came in 3.5% uh, higher in March than it was a year ago. The consumer price index uh, came in 3.5% in March. It's a little bit higher than it was a year ago. This is not the inflation that sealed Jimmy Carter's doom as a one-term president. Carter's inflation was in the double digits. I'll go over that in a second. This, the Biden economy is nothing like what got Reagan elected in 80. The problem right now is Americans have gotten accustomed to low inflation. During the past few decades, inflation has been almost non-existence. At times, at least right after the financial collapse of 2008, uh, we ran the risk of deflation. This inflation is something new to a lot of younger people. It's manageable, especially now considering that wages outpace inflation for the first time in years. If you're on a fixed income, groceries have gotten way too expensive. But we've learned this has nothing to do with Joe Biden's fiscal spending. Joe Manchin and the Republicans are blaming all of this on President Biden providing a social safety net. If you look at the incredible profit margins for food companies, 
especially the food companies that sell garbage you shouldn't be eating, the profits are through the roof. Why is this? And this concerns me uh, because food for Americans concern me. I, I, I do get people writing to me saying they can't afford their groceries, and this concerns me. And I'm going to talk in a, in a moment about how Joe Biden is fighting for consumers, especially when it comes to groceries, and he's not getting enough attention. I'll get to this in a sec in a second. So why why are gr- the why are the price why are the uh, why are grocery prices going up? Well, inflation in general is is a fever. It, it uh, Americans begin to believe it's real, and then corporate America gets away with charging more, not because of uh, rising labor costs or the rising costs of raw materials. They get away with it because it's a fever, and consumers catch the fever. They believe inflation is real, and they don't blame, the consumers don't blame the rising prices on what really causes inflation, and that is corporate greed. We've seen the emergence of a new word last year, greedflation. And there are ways to combat greedflation. Uh, But Americans are no longer conditioned to understand how we can combat greedflation. Most Americans have been brainwashed Anything in America these days that challenges corporate orthodoxy is immediately and falsely labeled socialism. It's not. Richard Nixon, not a socialist. During uh, the Nixon administration, when inflation hit 5%, which at the time was considered unacceptable, he announced a 90-day wage and price freeze. For 90 days, corporations were forbidden from raising prices or handing out raises. Can you imagine a president or a Congress allowing uh, that, a 90-day wage and price freeze? Now, two years later, we ended up with stagflation. Uh, which is a recession and inflation. A lot of right-wing economists say Nixon's wage and price controls had something to do with that, but uh, I don't think so. By the summer of 1980, the final year of Carter, Jimmy Carter's administration, this is why he lost to Reagan, okay? It wasn't the hostages that played a minor role in it. That was an election about the economy. The way this election is going to be won on the issue of abortion, in 1980, uh, the final year of the Carter administration, inflation was hovering above 14.5% And unemployment was at 7.5%. So you had uh, inflation and uh, a, I'd say at 7.5% unemployment, that would be stagflation, right? Recession and inflation. Again, When people say Biden is going to end up being a one-term president like Jimmy Carter, the economies simply don't match. When people talk about inflation uh, being Biden's downfall, the numbers don't match. Jimmy Carter was a one-term president because inflation was 14.5%. What is it now? 3.5%. 5%. Unemployment was 7.5%. What is unemployment in America? 3.8%. I mean, the numbers simply do not match. Uh, 
One of the main, I, I'm going to talk about how to combat greedflation. One of the main drivers of inflation in 1980 was the oil companies price gouging the American consumer. By 1980, they had us convinced they were running out of oil. They cited the Paley Commission, which was uh, Bill Paley, who ran CBS, set up a commission for Harry Truman, I think it was like 1952. And Paley, buried in the report, was a warning that America will run out of oil by the 1970s and we need to switch to solar and find new sources of energy. And the oil companies couldn't wait to cite the Paley report and said, we're running out of fossil fuels. There's a shortage. So we have to charge you more for it. And they price gouged. Carter decided to punish the oil companies by convincing his democratically controlled Congress to pass what was called, it's amazing. It's like, this is another country. They passed the crude oil windfall profit tax of 1980. I mean, it's amazing that the way we are now and the way we address problems back then. The windfall, the oil windfall profit tax in 1980 lasted eight years. It was punitive. They were punishing the oil companies. It was a message to the oil companies. We know the price of oil is going up because you're doing it arbitrarily. It's creating windfall profits for Exxon. So we're going to tax your windfall profits. That tax lasted eight years. It has never been done again. We've never had a windfall profit tax again. I mean, every hedge fund in America should be facing windfall profit taxes. Uh, but why, ha, why did they get rid of the windfall profit tax on, uh, on the oil companies? Why haven't we ever had a windfall profit tax since? Because the oil companies own half are members of Congress. And the other half of Congress is owned by Wall Street. Taxing windfall profits derived from price gouging is considered anti-capitalist. It's Marxist. Uh, well, you know what really is anti-capitalist? Price fixing, price gouging, monopolies. But Congress... They don't have a problem with that. In today's political climate, Nixon's wage and price freeze, Carter's windfall profit taxes would be called Marxist. The windfall profit tax lasted throughout the Reagan administration. Reagan got rid of it his last year in office. So again, Trump's strongest case against Joe Biden is inflation. But like I said, you cannot run against greedy corporations. Uh, because of the politics, there's very little in a presidential tool belt to fight inflation. Congress and the president have abdicated all monetary policy to the Federal Reserve, which Federal Reserve thinks it can control inflation by raising and lowering interest rates. Congress <clears throat> can fight inflation supposedly by cutting spending and increasing taxes. Price, uh, prices would go down with less money in circulation and fewer people would be working. In other words, for the past 100 years, Economists have been convinced that in order to bring inflation down, you have to create a recession. You have to put people out of work. Again, Congress can do that by cutting spending and raising taxes, or the Fed <clears throat> can create a recession by raising interest rates. We've always believed the cure to inflation was putting people out of work. This is how economists have talked about inflation for at least a century. If you want 
It's receive wisdom. If you want prices to come down, put people out of work. Turns out that may not be true, especially now with globalization. Prices for raw goods are subject to markets beyond our control. The raw goods come from all over the world. Oil, even domestic oil, is pegged to the international market. That's thanks to Barack Obama. As a favor to the oil companies, domestic oil is pegged to the international market, which means there's no such thing as energy independence. All our domestic oil is sold on the world market. So you cannot drill baby drill your way to energy independence. Barack Obama allowed the price of oil, domestic oil, to be pegged to the international market. If there's a worldwide glut of oil, prices for domestic oil drilled here go down, and American oil companies stop stop drilling, and that eventually creates a shortage which brings the price of oil up, and along with that, higher profits for the oil companies. The oil companies have taught the rest of corporate America that inflation is good for the bottom line. When the price of oil goes through the roof, oil companies pass the costs on to consumers. Their profit margins never change. So oil companies have learned it's more efficient just to keep prices high. Drill baby drill isn't the answer. They don't want to drill. There's more profit in not drilling and artificially keeping the price of oil high. It's a lot less work to sell oil at inflated prices than it is to drill for more oil and sell it cheaper. Two years ago, when oil prices were going through the roof, Exxon announced record profits because they pass along the price, the cost of the raw goods to the consumer. Exxon said it had no plans to drill baby drill. When, when oil prices were through the roof, Republicans kept saying, we need to drill baby drill. And the oil company said, no, we don't want to. We don't, we, thank you, we're good. We don't need to, to drill. Exxon said, no, we're not going to drill. And you know what we're going to do with all our excess profits? We're not going to invest in new oil fields. We're going to do stock buybacks and increase dividends. And during COVID, the rest of corporate America realized that they could capitalize on what the oil companies originally called supply chain issues, right? The oil companies can always raise prices by saying, well, we have supply chain issues. Uh, We're having trouble getting the oil from Saudi Arabia. We're having trouble getting it uh, out of Alaska, so it's, it's going to, we have supply chain issues. And suddenly all of corporate America had supply chain issues. Parts arriving from overseas were slowing down because of COVID, we were told. So they were able to charge more for cars and washing machines and profits doubled. Do you remember when on the show I was saying Read the financial statements of all these companies. I guarantee you they're going to post record profits, and they did. When the supply chain issues from COVID subsided, American corporations, they kept prices high. Even though the cost of raw materials came down, consumers, corporate America figured... Consumers have gotten used to paying more for this. 
and they still believe in this fiction of supply chain issues, uh, they're not going to check our bottom lines and realize we're posting record profits because we're gouging them. Uh, so they kept the prices high. Greedflation. And what we have here in America is because of the concentration, not just of wealth, but of power and uh, pricing power, uh, consumers really can't shop around for cheaper products. There are fewer and fewer companies in America because the bigger companies gobble up the small ones. There are now, this is unbelievable. This is, this is unbelievable. Anyone who says this is capitalism can go F themselves. This is not what Adam Smith described. There are now 43% fewer publicly traded companies than there were in 1996. In other words, a publicly traded company is Exxon. You can buy stock in Exxon. Uh, Trump Media, uh, last time I checked, is still a publicly traded company. There are now 43% fewer publicly traded companies than there were in 1996. In 1996, if you wanted to buy stock in a company, there were 8,090 publicly traded corporations. Last year, there were 4,000 572. Why? It's not capitalism. When a company starts making inroads, they get gobbled up by bigger corporations. Where do you think the major innovations at, say, Apple, Microsoft, or Meta come from? You think it's research and development? Partly, but most of that research and development is shopping around for corporate startups to buy. Corporate startups that have something these big corporations can benefit from. Or they have something that the big corporations worry could destroy them. I mean, Facebook meta is just a series of Mark Zuckerberg's, it's just purchases that Mark Zuckerberg has made. Somebody develops some company develops something and he buys the company. It's not research and development. Uh, so that's why we have fewer and fewer corporations in the hands of fewer and fewer people. That causes inflation, not to mention private equity firms that literally take a publicly traded company private. They'll, they'll buy up all the shares uh, and it's no longer a publicly traded company. And that means there's no transparency and far less government oversight. That is the trend since 1996. Fewer corporations as publicly traded corporations buy up smaller publicly traded corporations. Fewer publicly traded corporations as private equity firms buy up publicly traded companies, and turn them private. As money gets concentrated into fewer and fewer hands, in the hands of fewer and fewer corporations, that means little to no competition. And little to no competition means pricing power. It's called pricing power. You can charge whatever you want. When you hear earnings calls, these corporations brag about their pricing power. What that means is we're a monopoly. The cable companies leave consumers with one choice. Either you want cable television or you don't get cable television. You either... It's been deregulated a little, uh, but you're left, you know, how many cell phones can you buy? How many companies make cell phones? Uh, when you want to fly commercial, how many choices do you have? If you're flying into Des Moines, Iowa, 
How many choices do you have? How many airline choices do you have? So I said I would talk about the heroic work that Joe Biden is doing and how it's un, underreported. There is one arrow in a president's quiver when it comes to really fighting inflation. Uh, and that is using his Federal Trade Commission and his Justice Department to stop these big mergers. And the Biden administration has been trying to block mergers. Uh, they've had some success, not too much success. But the Biden administration just sued, talking about grocery prices here, the Biden administration just sued to block the merger between Kroger's and Albertsons, which would have been the largest supermarket merger in U.S. history. That is how you keep food prices down. And this is an underreported story because Albertsons and Kroger's, they advertise. <clears throat> On February 26, Joe Biden sued to block this $25 billion merger. In the suit, the Biden FTC said this merger between Kroger's and Albertsons would result in less competition and thus higher prices for groceries. The FTC, the Biden FTC said the merger would also result in massive layoffs, as all mergers do destroying tens of thousands of good-paying union jobs. But is that story getting the attention it deserves? Of course not. If Americans paid half the attention to Biden's FTC's antitrust lawsuits, as we do to this Trump hush money payment to a porn star lawsuit, uh we'd see a massive reconfiguration of our economy and the polls wouldn't be uh, as tight as they are right now. Biden's lawsuit blocking the Albertsons-Kroger merger is a real kitchen table issue. Literally, it's about what you pay for food. It's Biden using one of the most powerful tools at his disposal to bring down the price of groceries, and everybody should be talking about this trial. And that's why Trump cannot talk about inflation. The one issue he could talk about without having to lie, he can't because inflation is caused by greedy corporations and he cannot go after his paymasters. How are we doing here? All right. Uh, should I keep going? I got... See, if I don't keep going, these things pile up on my desk, and, uh, and I want to be able to talk about Trump's trial tomorrow. So let me just plow through a couple more stories. Give me 10 more minutes. Is that okay? All right. So Republicans, uh, they're stuck with abortion and they're stuck on immigration. If you remember, Texas passed a law empowering state police to enforce federal immigration laws. It violates our Constitution. And so the Biden administration is challenging that in the courts. Iowa's odious Republican governor, Kim Reynolds, hopped onto the migrant hysteria bandwagon by signing a law last week similar to the one in Texas that will give her state law enforcement officials the authority to arrest undocumented Americans in Iowa. She might want to check with the people running her slaughterhouses and her farmers about how they feel about her state police rounding up undocumented workers. I'm pretty sure 
undocumented workers are baked into their business models. Where would Iowa's slaughterhouses, where would its farming industry be without undocumented workers? As Trump said about the abortion ban, uh, this is political malpractice. I, I don't see how this helps Republicans in Iowa. Well, why is she doing this? Why is she cracking down on migrants? Especially when so many jobs are going unfilled. Uh, The Iowa governor needs the migrants to distract from Iowa's six-week abortion ban. Here's where abortion stands in Iowa. Last July... This is about a year after Roe was overturned. In July of 2023, Iowa's six-week abortion ban went into effect. It bans abortion in most cases after six weeks. Women don't even realize they're pregnant six weeks in. A district judge in Iowa paused the six-week ban, allowing it to go through the appeals process. So... As of now, there's a 20-week abortion ban in effect in Iowa. But Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds asked the Supreme Court of Iowa to overturn the lower court's ruling and reinstate the six-week abortion ban, which Donald Trump calls political malpractice. Kim Reynolds endorsed Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in the Iowa caucuses. If you remember, I keep bringing this up, in Iowa, you got to, the conventional wisdom was, you want to win Iowa, and as a Republican, you got to make nice with the evangelicals, the pro-life movement. This is where Ted Cruz won. This is where... Uh, Santorum won because they were big pro-life candidates. Trump, I mean, I hate the guy, but you got to give him credit. In Iowa, he said, "I'm, I'm not as strong on abortion as you want me to be, and I'm not going to be. Uh, And He won Iowa. Uh, Kim Reynolds endorsed Ron DeSantis. DeSantis signed into law a six-week abortion ban in Florida that was just upheld by the state Supreme Court. Although they did allow a proposition for the November ballot uh, where Floridians can vote on whether or not the state constitution of Florida should guarantee a woman's right to choose. So abortion is going to be on the ballot in Florida. This is a nightmare for the GOP. DeSantis lost in Iowa. Trump won in Iowa, turning his back on the pro-life movement. He's trying to make the pro-life movement go away. Uh, The Iowa Supreme Court began hearing oral arguments on Thursday about the six-week abortion ban. Right now, this is amazing. According to the Associated Press, 14 states have adopted near-total abortion bans since the Dobbs decision two years ago. This was Trump's Supreme Court overturning Roe. Abortion is no longer a philosophical, moral, or legal debate. It is real. I mean, there are real practical ramifications to the Supreme Court overturning Roe. This is not some hypothetical argument. Uh, for decades, Republicans were using abortion just to raise money on, uh, like Trump in 2016 actually becoming president and thinking, I didn't think I'd actually get to be president. Nobody actually thought 
somebody would be able to appoint three right-wing imbeciles to the Supreme Court and get Roe overturned. So Trump is trying to thread the needle. He thinks he's being smart by going with states' rights. And on the surface, at first glance, you go, oh, that's smart. And then you realize, wait, he's going to stake out a state's rights position where 14 states have now adopted near total abortion bans. He's against the 15-week abortion ban. He's going with states' rights. And he thinks that's the mature position when it comes to abortion. Left to the states, abortion rights completely disappear, at least left to the deep red states. And this will not be resolved between now and November. Uh, Donald Trump was smart for distancing himself from the pro-life movement. This state's rights argument uh, is horrendous. Uh, It's painting him into an even worse corner. States' rights on abortion is identical to the states' rights position of the segregationists back in the 1960s. When you say you believe in states' rights, it means you support the Jim Crow South and now the subjugation of women's reproductive rights. Trump's states' rights stance on abortion, on the surface, at first blush, politically savvy, but it's not. This is the albatross around his neck that is getting heavier and heavier, and it is going to bring the Republican Party down in November because no matter what position Republicans try to stake out vis-a-vis abortion, it's going to alienate half their base. No matter what they say to wiggle their way out of it, they offend somebody. They either offend the evangelical pro-life movement or a vast majority of suburban moms in swing states. Abortion is like slavery. You can't be a little enslaved, which is what the Jim Crow laws try to accomplish. And you also can't be a little pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. You either have a right to an abortion or you do not have a right to an abortion. There is no middle ground here. And the polling shows women like the blacks during the civil rights movement of the 1960s are not going backwards. This is the playing field Joe Biden and the Democrats wanted. They got it. It's abortion, and it is going to get so much worse for the Republicans between now and November. There's nothing they can do. Nothing. For Trump, abortion is something he wishes would go away like one of those unwanted pregnancies he's had. Abortion for him and the Wall Street Republicans was always the political football, a way to bring deeply religious conservative Christians into the fold. The idea, up until the Dobbs decision, always was promise you'll overturn Roe, but in the end, what you accomplish is tax cuts for the rich, and abortion is untouched. That's what Reagan did, promised to overturn Roe. He gave tax cuts to the rich. George W. Bush promised to overturn Roe, gave tax cuts to the rich. This schmuck, Donald Trump, promised to overturn Roe. He did give tax cuts to the rich, but 
He overturned Roe. He did the unthinkable. And we're seeing the consequences. It's devastating for women. Uh, And what Trump and the Republicans are up against right now is a party leadership on the state and local level and in the House. True believers. These are true. You got true believers inside the Republican caucus in the House. 120 Business Insider uh, in February reported that 125 House Republicans signed onto a law earlier this year that declares life begins at conception with no exceptions, including in vitro fertilization. People like Speaker Mike Johnson, they are true believers. They are true believers. Abortion is the glue that holds the GOP coalition together. You can't, Trump just can't walk away from it. The, 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 the coalition is, you, you got Wall Street, but, you know, they don't, there aren't enough voters on Wall Street. It's the real coalition, the white racists, the Christian nationalists, and contained within the Christian nationalists, you've got your pro-life movement. And when you ask a Christian nationalist like Mike Johnson, uh, why are you willing to jump on a live grenade for Donald Trump? He'll say abortion. He truly sees, Mike Johnson truly sees this as a war between good and evil. People like Mike Johnson will forgive all of Donald Trump's trespasses because Donald Trump delivered a Supreme Court that overturned Roe. Mike Johnson honestly believes, thanks to Trump, millions of babies have been spared because the Dobbs decision, Trump's responsible for the Dobbs decision. He's busy taking credit for it. Mike Johnson believes millions of babies have been spared, even though there have been more abortions performed since Roe was overturned, just not in Texas or Florida. Arizona, as you know, has a Supreme Court that on Tuesday allowed an anti-abortion law dating back to 1864 to go into effect. All abortions, except those to save a mother's life, are now illegal in Arizona. The abortion pill, it it goes into effect in two weeks. Uh, The abortion pill will be illegal. It is now possible for doctors, they're saying, to be prosecuted and sent to prison for performing an abortion It's a six-week abortion ban, but they're saying doctors would be prosecuted for performing an abortion uh, after 15 weeks. The state legislature in Arizona is controlled by Republicans. The governor, however, and the attorney general in Arizona are both Democrats and women. The attorney general said she will not enforce this law. And the governor has asked the Republican-controlled state legislature to overturn the law we saw last week. They refused. Donald Trump got on the phone urging Republicans in the state legislature to overturn the law. We'll see what happens this week. And now Republican Carrie Lake, who is running for Senate... She, too, is also urging the state legislature to overturn the law, which I think goes into effect. I don't think they're sure when it goes into effect. I think it's in two weeks. But Carrie Lake, running for Senate as a Republican in Arizona, is overturning, asking the state legislature to overturn the law. A far cry from what Carrie Lake said back in 2022 when she was running for governor. Here is Carrie Lake, the election denier, 
here she is back in 2022 calling abortion demonic, calling abortion an execution. And this, she's running for Senate against Ruben Gallego, probably. The primaries are, I believe, in July. But this is probably going to be the matchup. This is Carrie Lake in 2022 running for governor, calling abortion demonic and calling it an execution. This is going to lose her the election. It is almost demonic. It feels very evil. But can you imagine, Benny, having that much vitriol and being being like that and supporting the killing of innocent babies in the mother's womb? It's just I hope someday they wake up to what the lies they've been fed about abortion. It is not it is not health care. It is the killing. It is the sacrifice. It is the execution of a baby in the mother's womb. And it's incredibly sad. When I'm governor, I want to make sure we spend our tax money helping young women and mothers who are, are nervous and afraid about a maybe unexpected uh, pregnancy. We want to help them so they can make the best decision. They can either carry that baby through and be that mother that uh, takes care of that baby, or we can help find adoption resources. But we plan to help scared, frightened, um, women who find themselves pregnant and we want to get them help. We want to encourage them to, to choose life like their mother chose life. Because uh, your mother didn't have a choice. You're a liar. Uh, you, We want you to have your baby and then when you have the baby, the Republican policy is you're on your own. Republicans have no interest in helping mothers once they have the baby. In every state where abortion is next to illegal, infant mortality rates are through the roof. The morbidity rates of mothers who die during childbirth are through the roof. These are the same states that turn down Medicaid expansion. They have, wherever you see the strictest abortion laws, you see the the flimsiest social safety net for single moms or any moms. These are the same states that want mothers to find jobs before they qualify for food stamps, before they qualify for Medicaid. These are the same states that offer zero support for child care. These are the same states that won't raise the minimum wage, that are anti-union, that that put working moms into permanent cycles of debt. These states want women to keep their babies. They want these women to stay home with their babies. They do not want the women working. They want the babies, once they turn 12, to go to work. Take a look at what's going on in Sarah Huckabee's Arkansas, where she's lowering... Uh, child labor laws. Uh, We've talked about Steve Moore from the Heritage Foundation. We've heard Newt Gingrich espouse this. Children should be working, they say. Preteens should be working in construction, farming, while the moms stay home because that's the way it used to be back in 1864 when black people were still enslaved. So Carrie Lake cannot distance herself from this Arizona abortion ban. Her fingerprints are all over it. Here she is back in 2022, anticipating the Supreme Court overturning Roe. This is a conversation she had when she was running for governor of Arizona. Uh, In 2022, we knew the court was going to overturn uh, Roe. The uh, the Alito decision got leaked. Here she is anticipating the Supreme Court overturning Roe and telling voters there's a there's a great law on the books that dates back to the Civil War, and she's for it. And, and again, what, I'll echo what Steve just said. We have a great law on the books right now. If that happens, uh, we will be a state where. We will not be taking the lives of our unborn anymore. Okay, and she's going to try to walk that back. She's going to say, no, I wasn't for the what they call the territorial law. I was for the 15-week 
abortion ban, not the territorial law. But that's not true. Before the Arizona Supreme Court ruled that the law from 1864 was constitutional, Carrie Lake, as a Senate candidate, was on the PBS in Arizona. And she was asked, which of the two laws do you prefer? Do you prefer the Arizona law that bans abortion after about 15 weeks or what is called the territorial law, the law that was passed back in 1864 when Arizona wasn't yet a state? And this is the law that's about to go into effect. Here's the answer. She's going to try to walk it back. But here she is last year. On the PBS, the new law banning abortion. Well, the new law banning abortion in Arizona after 15 weeks. There's that law, and there's a territorial era law which bans all abortion. Zippo over. Which law do you think should take effect? My personal belief is that all life matters, all life counts, and all life is precious. And I don't believe in abortion. I think the older law is going to take uh, is going to go into effect. That's what I believe will happen. Okay, but and, but you approve of that? Uh, uh, what at, at conception? I believe life begins at conception. Okay, what do we do about abortion pills? What do we do about? I don't uh, think abortion pills should be legal. That's it, a very not good in thing. Arizona. There you go. So she's trying to walk that back. That's what she said last year. I believe life begins at conception. <clears throat> I don't believe in abortion pills. She supports the 1864 law. Well, she supported the 1864 law uh, right up until it was no longer viable. Now she's backing away from it. But she, this is going to be played over and over again in the race for Senate. Now, Republicans think the road to control of the Senate is through flipping Arizona from blue to red. Kirsten Sinema is the current senator. She was elected as a Democrat, then became an independent who caucuses with the Democrats last year. She's not running for re-election. Good riddance to her. Congressman Ruben Gallego is expected to win uh, the Democratic primary. I think it's in July. I think that the Arizona's primaries are in July. And Carrie Lake is expected to win the Republican nomination in July. So this uh, affects control of the Senate and Arizona, Joe Biden won Arizona in 2020. How is abortion going to affect Arizona? Democrat Katie Hobbs was elected governor. She beat Carrie Lake in 2022 by 17,000 votes. Close. Democrat Adrian Fontes was elected Secretary of State in 2022. Chris Mays is the Attorney General. She, too, is a Democrat and was elected in 2022. They have two Democratic senators. Arizona is leaning blue. Generally speaking, right now, Trump leads Biden in the polls, in the Arizona polls, but it's within the margin of error. But Democrat Ruben Gallego has been leading Carrie Lake consistently. Some polls show him beating her by eight points. I don't think we're going to see tickets splitting come November in Arizona. I think women... And men, but women will be coming out to vote against Carrie Lake and Donald Trump. I think Biden wins Arizona partly on the updraft from Ruben Gallego. People are going to turn out for him. And if you're voting for Gallego, there's no way you're voting for Trump. There will be no ticket splitting in Arizona. In Ohio, Democrat, Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown is running for re-election in Ohio. I think there might be ticket splitting here. Uh, Republicans are hoping to flip that seat. MAGA Republican Bernie Moreno won the nomination, even though he's never held elective office. 
And his only qualifications are he owns a car dealership and Donald Trump supports him. Back in November of 2023, Ohio voted overwhelmingly to enshrine a woman's right to choose in their state constitution. So abortion, technically going into this November, wasn't supposed to be on the ballot. But it is because there's now a mini civil war in the Republican Party over this national 15-week abortion ban. Trump opposes it. Lindsey Graham introduced the uh, uh, the 15-week abortion ban. This is an issue now in November. You're running for Senate. Are you going to vote for Lindsey Graham's 15-week abortion ban? Uh, Bernie Moreno is now going to be forced to carve out his position on abortion, one that is going to be shaky after voters resoundingly voted in uh, favor uh, of enshrining a woman's right to choose in their constitution. Here is Bernie Moreno on abortion. It's not good. If you wants to beat Sherrod Brown. Not good. He starts off reminding us that he's the father of two daughters, which makes him qualified to opine on a woman's reproductive rights. But then what follows is as sick as anything any Republican has ever said on the issue of abortion. As a dad of two girls, it's about having that girl be able to be raped and having the rapist force her to have an abortion all without your consent as a minor. All right, let, let, let's just repeat that one more time. It's about having your daughter getting to be raped. Let, let me hear that again. As a dad of two girls, it's about having that girl be able to be raped and having the rapist force her to have an abortion all without your consent as a minor. So this is about rapists forcing their victims to uh, have abortions because that's what rapists do, right? We know this. Rapists stick around after they rape to make sure the victim aborts the baby. And... uh, That's why fewer than 1% of all rapists end up getting apprehended, tried, and convicted. Because after they rape a woman, they always stick around and drag the victim to an abortion clinic, and that's where they're caught, forcing their victims to get an abortion at the abortion clinic. All the statistics back that up so long as you're inventing them. Well, Ohio is a real... (laughs) Jesus, these people. Ohio is a reliably red state. But here's where we're going to find ticket splitting. It is conceivable. uh, Maybe conceivable isn't the right word when I'm talking about abortion, but uh, it is probable that voters will pick Sherrod Brown over Bernie Moreno, but going up the ballot, they'll pick Donald Trump. Who knows? Uh, But I think that's the way it's going to go. Obama won Ohio by five points in uh, 2008, three points in 2012. Trump beat Hillary by nine points in Ohio. Trump beat Biden by eight points. Ohio... Uh, is not in play for Joe Biden. Uh, The unemployment rate there right now is 3.7%. So they've got full employment. In November 2016, when Trump beat Hillary in Ohio, the unemployment rate was 5.3%. In October of 2020, when the people of Ohio were casting their ballots, unemployment was 6.8%. They still went for Trump. I don't think Ohio is voting for their economic well-being. If they were J.D. Vance, uh, wouldn't have won 
in 2022. He got elected to the Senate. Uh, I think Ohio is a state that ignores economic data and cares more about the culture wars. Even though they enshrined a woman's right to choose in their constitution. But <clears throat> I think they've, they've shown themselves to fall prey to culture wars. Uh, I would be surprised if Ohio will be in play. But, and I'm going to wrap it up. Now we come to North Carolina. Now we come to, it's one of my favorite races. North Carolina. Obama won it in 2008. Lost it in 2012 to Romney, but it was close. Trump won it 2016-2020. North Carolina. The unemployment rate currently stands at 3.5%. So this race, like Ohio, I think will be waged on the culture wars, on abortion. Unlike J.D. Vance winning the culture war in 2022, uh, you got a Republican nominee for governor. He's uh, Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. And uh, he's a piece of work. He's running against State Attorney General Josh Stein, who would become North Carolina's first Jewish governor. You got yourself a serious uh, culture war going on. Uh, Mark Robinson, first black governor of North Carolina. Josh Stein would be North Carolina's first Jewish governor. You got a serious culture war going on. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Robinson is black, he's homophobic, he's a Holocaust denier, he's a Christian nationalist, almost a white Christian nationalist. He's called, he's called gay people maggots. Uh, and abortion. As of July of 2023, North Carolina law prohibits an abortion after 12 weeks. Rape and incest, it's permitted up until the 20th week. Abortion will be on the ballot. This is bad for Trump. He doesn't want abortion on the ballot. For some reason, he endorsed Mark Robinson, who he called Dr. Martin Luther King on steroids. Last week, Trump compared himself to Nelson Mandela, so... Take that for what it's worth. Uh, a new Quinnipiac poll shows Democrat Josh Stein carving out a pretty big lead against Mark Robinson, with Stein leading Robinson by as much as eight points. So this is another case where Biden benefits, I believe, from the updraft of a down-ticket candidate like Josh Stein. I don't think there'll be tickets splitting in, in North Carolina. Democrats, women, blacks, and the LGBTQ community will be voting for Josh Stein over Lieutenant Governor Robinson, and they're not going to vote for Trump. They will be drawn to the polls to elect Josh Stein. They'll be drawn by their hatred for Mark Robinson, and I believe they will cast their ballot for Biden. No ticket splitting. Quinnipiac now lists North Carolina's presidential race as too close to call. That's incredible. Uh, Trump beats Biden by only two percentage points, according to Quinnipiac. That's within the margin of error. North Carolina has always been uh, close. Again, uh, Trump beat Hillary by two percentage points. Trump beat Biden by 1.3 percentage points. 
Now, North Carolina has 15 electoral votes. We're going to be hearing a lot about North Carolina because of the Biden firewall that he needs. Biden's firewall is Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. The map is set. And so if Biden wins Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, that gets him to 270. I've gone over this with you. He can lose Arizona and Georgia, even though he won them in 2020. Hillary lost Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, as well as Arizona and Georgia. And uh, Biden won them, and that's what put him over the top. But all he needed was Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin to get to 270. He can lose Arizona and Georgia. Uh, Georgia looks iffy. Arizona, I think, will break for Biden. But of that Midwestern triumvirate, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, he has to win those three. Wisconsin is the iffiest of the three. And then Biden, we always thought, would need either Arizona or Georgia to replace Wisconsin. But now North Carolina has, North Carolina is in play. And it has 15 electoral votes. Wisconsin has 10. North Carolina is going to be in play come November. And come November, by November, North Carolina voters are going to be bombarded with ads featuring Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson saying this about abortion. You know, I ain't supposed to say this, but I'm going to say it. I don't care whether you just got pregnant. I don't care if you're 24 hours pregnant. I don't care if you're 24 weeks pregnant. I don't care. If you kill that young man, it's murder. You got blood on your hands. Mm. And voters are going to be bombarded with ads featuring Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson saying this. Make no mistake about it. This is a Christian nation. And as long as there are faithful people who will fall down on their faces to pray for this place, it will always be a Christian nation. Jesus Christ is the reason why we are a blessed and prosperous land. Okay. And then it turns out ABC News reported that Mark Robinson not only filed for bankruptcy, he failed to pay federal income taxes for five years. Donald Trump calls Mark Robinson Martin Luther King on steroids. I think he's Donald Trump on steroids. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Let's go to a poll. Let me, uh, let me just wrap it up here. We have a poll. Let's see if anybody's still here. Uh, I went long. I don't know why I went long. I'm David Feldman reminding oh, there you. There you are. Well, we have an interesting results. This is why I love doing this show. This is really interesting. This is so effing interesting. So uh, we have 2,376 votes. And the question that I asked uh, the people who are watching me live on YouTube in the chat room, here's the question. What single issue does Donald Trump want to disappear more than any other by November? And there were four choices. Biden's economy, Biden's crime rate, abortion, or Trump's criminal trials. And we have... 2,387 votes. I'll give you a, a little more time to, to vote because uh, in case you're watching me live on YouTube, go into the 
the chat room. If you enjoyed any of this, please share it with your friends uh, and copy and paste the link to the show uh, and share it via social media and uh, or an email or a text message and subscribe to my channel. And of course, leave a comment. I am going to try to read the super chats. I, I have a new software program. So I have a super chat from Howard Yu. Thanks for your help untangling all the craziness out there. Great show. Thank you, Howard. And I have a super chat from Maria Vetson. And she just says thank you. So I'm going to... There you go. I actually was able to thank the super chats. Okay. I cannot do shows that are two and a half hours long. I don't know what to do. I, 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 I really would like to do the show like five nights a week for, you know, and each episode is like 30 minutes. But I start writing and gathering stories, and I'm burning myself out. And then I end up doing two and a half hours, and then I'm exhausted, and I have to, I, I don't know how to organize my thoughts and do shorter shows. I, I'd like to do more shows that are shorter, and I can't figure out how, how to do that. Okay, I'm going to stop the poll. What single issue does Donald Trump want to disappear more than any other by November? At the bottom, with 2%, Biden's crime rate. Coming in third, Biden's economy with 14%. And my, this, is, this is why I love doing this. I have been saying it's abortion, abortion, abortion. 39% of my listeners in the chat room say abortion. Abortion uh, comes in uh, uh, second. And 45% out of 2,460 votes, 45% say it's Trump's criminal trials. That's what he wants more than anything else to disappear. Interesting. And I have another... Uh, uh, super chat from Brend Blended Leaf Gerard Show can't tell us until tomorrow show okay I'm not sure what a Gerard Show can't tell us well thank you for the super chat um, okay all right that's it that, that's I'm gonna end the poll isn't that that's fascinating uh, 45% think Trump is more concerned about the criminal trials than uh, abortion. I disagree with my listeners. I think it's abortion, abortion, abortion. All right, I got to figure out how to end the show and do a shorter one tomorrow night. Thank you all for listening. 